Brothers and sisters, good evening. My name is Sister Angela Marie, and I'm the coordinator of Adult Faith Formation and Catechesis for the Archdiocese, and I'm here tonight again at the Pastoral Center, St. John Paul II, um, with Clay Emo, that is running the technology piece for us. And we're um, overjoyed to celebrate the Feast of the Evangelist, St. Mark, with all of you. Um, in the Gospel today from St. Mark's um, and Mass, we read, Jesus appeared to the eleven and said to them, Go into the whole world and proclaim the gospel to every creature. So the beautiful call from our Lord to go out and proclaim the good news, the good news of his love for us, the good news of his message of salvation. And so we do know very deeply our Lord's present presence to us, definitely through the Eucharist and through our community, but also through his own word. And tonight we'll have the opportunity to learn more about the Gospel of St. Mark with Father Nick Meisel. So Father Nick Meisel that is here with us tonight was ordained as a priest for the Archdiocese of Vancouver in 2013. Since then he has uh, completed his license from the Pontifical Biblical Institute in Rome. And currently, Father Nick teaches at St. Mark's and Corpus Christi College here in Vancouver. He also serves in several parishes and in high school ministry. So we're gr very grateful for Father's presence tonight here. And um, I'd like to begin with a prayer. And our prayer tonight is taken from the Proclaim movement. As many of you, the Archdiocese has launched a wonderful movement just at the end of 2019. Um, and it seemed very appropriate uh, with the call to proclaim the good news and the gospel that we begin with that prayer. I know many of you have joined us in the Proclaim movement. Many of you have already been trained and are already out there proclaiming God's word. So let's start together with that beautiful prayer and uh, continue to, um, to pray that others might join us as we strive to make uh, Christ to the world. So let's pray together. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, when your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, rose from the dead, he commissioned his followers to go and make disciples of all nations. Through baptism, you make us sharers in the church's mission. Empower your disciples in the lower mainland with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Fill them with courage and zeal for proclaiming Jesus and bearing witness to the joy of the gospel. May the great commission entrusted to the church find fresh expressions, bringing new life and light to your people. Inspire many disciples to join the proclaimed movement. Fill them with enthusiasm and hope for reaching their family, friends, and associates with the saving message of the good news. May they eagerly participate in the available training and formation and become ardent ambassadors of a new spiritual impulse, which will transform hearts and minds. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters, Father Nick Meisel with us tonight. Hello, sister. Happy feast to you. Thank you, uh, Father. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Um, as sister said, I teach at St. Mark's Corpus Christi College. So to come and speak about the topic of St. Mark's Gospel is, is really wonderful. Such a beautiful gospel that we can contemplate here this evening. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome you all into uh, my office in my parish rectory. It's a bit strange, but welcome. And if you get bored during this talk, uh, you can look at the books behind me, and most of them are fake. I kind of cut them out so I can hide snacks in there. But I'm really looking forward to this talk here this evening. Uh, Sister Angela said I can talk about whatever it is that I want. So if, if you don't like what I talk about, you can ask her and you can get your money back. I'm sure she'd be happy to do that. Uh, but when we dive into this Gospel of Mark, before I, I talk about any Gospel, I think an interesting question we can ask is, well, why do we have four of them? Why do we have these other Gospels? Maybe it might be simpler if we just had one. So it's important for us to remember that each gospel portrays Jesus from a different perspective. They're complementary. And we're used to this more in art. So I like to share my screen here, if this works out. We're used to seeing different images or portrayals of Jesus in art. 
and we're kind of used to this, complementary pictures of Jesus. So, so for example, uh, we can see here from Rembrandt that Jesus Christ is portrayed more uh, like maybe somebody from the Middle East, maybe somebody who's from a rural or a pastoral setting, sort of a down-to-earth individual, someone we could believe is a carpenter. So that's one portrayal of Jesus that we find in art. Another portrayal of Jesus might be this one from an icon of the Panto Crater in Hagia Sophia. This icon is taken from the year 1261. Here we see a very, very different portrayal of Jesus than we found in Rembrandt. Here Jesus is a kind of Byzantine king. He's dressed like a Byzantine king. He's mighty, he's powerful. So here we have a very different portrayal of Jesus as well. Or perhaps we could consider this portrayal of Jesus. This is by the Jewish artist, Marc Chagall. This is actually a famous or a, one of the favorite uh, paintings of our Holy Father, Pope Francis from 1936. It's called White Crucifixion. In this uh, painting, Chagall has depicted Jesus as a kind of typical Jewish martyr. So around Jesus on the cross, we see other Jews who suffered in the Holocaust and the different programs throughout the centuries. So another portrayal of Jesus, another perspective of Jesus. Here we see another image or representation of Jesus. This is from Fritz Eichenberg. It's Jesus of the bread lines. So in this portrayal of Jesus, we see that Jesus Christ has been identified with the poor. And of course, this harkens back to Matthew 25. I was hungry and you gave me to eat. So we're used to seeing different portrayals of Jesus in art. And we might ask ourselves, which is the correct portrayal of Jesus? Of course, all these portrayals of Jesus are correct. They're different perspectives of Jesus. They're enriching, they're complementary. And the same goes for the four gospels that we've received through tradition. Tonight, this evening, we have the great privilege on the feast of St. Mark to look into the gospel of Mark to see the way that Mark has portrayed Jesus in a very particular, a very unique way. Right off the bat, when we start investigating the gospel of St. Mark, we notice that Mark's gospel lacks what we might call some of the quote unquote greatest hits of Jesus. So Mark's gospel is the shortest gospel. There's no birth of Jesus recorded. There's no Beatitudes. There's no Sermon on the Mount, no Good Samaritan, no uh, parable of the prodigal son. We see also when we read the Gospel of St. Mark that the depiction of Jesus, that portrayal, that painting that St. Mark has painted of Jesus is not often what we're used to or maybe even comfortable with. Mark, in the way of portraying Jesus, oftentimes emphasizes Jesus' frailty, emphasizes his suffering, his rejection. It's a certain ambiguity. If we love power, glory, and success, sometimes Mark's gospel is not our favorite. The gospel of Mark really is an incredibly complex, beautiful theological work. Again, as I mentioned, it's the shortest gospel that we have, and it's meant to be probably read or heard in one sitting. In fact, you can read or listen to the gospel of St. Mark in about an hour and a half. Mark's gospel is known for its interesting pace. It's breathless in places. Mark's gospel tells a coherent story, one filled with mystery, conflict, ups and downs. Overall, the plot of Mark's gospel could be described by the talk, what the talk has been entitled here this evening. Good news that is announced, opposed, and vindicated. There's a really incredible genius to the way that Mark has written his gospel. So Mark's gospel, again, as I mentioned, is the first one. And Mark didn't just kind of invent this genre of gospel writing out of the blue. We read in De Verbum, the document from the Second Vatican Council, that the Bible, or sacred scripture, is the word of God in the words of people. So every piece of scripture, Mark's gospel included, has God as the author, but also the human author, Mark, who wrote the gospel, used all his skills and creativity in writing this gospel. The Gospel of Mark is God's word, but in the words of people. So Mark wrote his gospel, obviously, in the Greek of that time, called Koine Greek. But in addition to this, Mark didn't just invent this genre or style of writing out of thin air. Mark tells the story of Jesus in a genre that was common at that time. This genre was called bios, and it was a kind of bibliography writing in the Greco-Roman world. So bios, or plural, bioi. And what's fascinating is that Mark takes 
the story of Jesus, and he writes it using this genre, but he changes this genre in very specific and significant ways. So the bios genre uh, was practiced or, or writings were, were carried out of famous people, individuals who were recognized almost universally as being people who are great, people of great importance. And some famous individuals who write the, wrote these bio were perhaps Plutarch, who wrote his lives, Suetonius, and also the Jewish writer Philo. He wrote, for example, a bios of Moses about his life. And these bio always focus on the words and the deeds of this individual, this great person. These bio were not exhaustive. They were representative episodes chosen from the life of that person. And these autobiographies, these biographies, these bio were written in order to highlight the virtues of the person in order to inspire action. So on the one hand, Mark's gospel and the other gospels have many similarities with the bios genre. They're written about one person, this, in this case, Jesus, his words and deeds. It's written in order to inspire imitation of that person. So Mark took this bios genre and used it to describe the life of Jesus, but it's very, very different in an important way. There's an enormous difference with the kind of bios about Jesus that we find in Mark's gospel. Remember, a bios was written about someone who was universally considered to be great. This person had what we could call horizontal recognition. They were recognized as being great and worthy of emulation by society. Jesus Christ, however, as we know, in these early years, was not considered great in this way by most Gentiles or even Jews. Jesus was crucified by the empire. He suffered a humiliating death. Jesus was seen as a blasphemer by many of his co-religionists. So Mark is quite a genius in taking this bios genre. How can you write a bios for a crucified blasphemer? Jesus lacks that horizontal recognition. His greatness is not recognized by many people. Sorry. We can see in this image here how Jesus would have been represented early on or, or viewed early on by society. So this is what I think is an interesting representation. This is, as far as I know, the earliest representation of Jesus on the cross that we find. And this depiction of the cru crucifixion was found on the Palatine Hill, and it was made somewhere around the year 200 AD, and it was sketched or engraved onto the wall of a barracks. So it looks like that in this inscription, what's happening is that the other soldiers in this barracks are mocking a soldier who happens to be Christian. And in this image, you can see the, the original one on the left and kind of an engraving or etching of it on the right. We see that there is a man who is worshiping a crucified donkey. And below this, we see this inscription that reads, Alex Amenos worships his God. So it seems that the other soldiers were mocking Alex Amenos because of who Jesus was. So we can see early on in these early years that Jesus Christ was not recognized as being great as the other characters in these bio would have been. The genius of Mark really is that he takes this bios genre, which should have been about a person who received universal horizontal recognition, seen as great by other people, and he shows that this horizontal recognition ultimately is not what is important. Mark, as he goes through his gospel, and we're going to see this coming up, shows that what is important is not horizontal recognition, recognition or acclaim from people, but rather vertical recognition. What is important ultimately that Jesus Christ was approved, recognized as great by God. And for this understanding of the gospel of Mark, I'm really indebted. I just want to recognize uh, Father Aletti's book, which is excellent, well worth checking out, The Birth of the Gospels as Biographies. This message that Mark conveys in Jesus in the gospel, ultimately, that Jesus Christ did not have that horizontal recognition, but ultimately that vertical recognition is, was all that was important, was very a very powerful message when we consider who the audience of Mark's gospel was. So Mark's gospel is generally considered to be written around the year 65 to 73 AD. It was probably written to a congregation in Rome. 
At this time, there was the Jewish war with Rome. It was just after the persecutions of Christians that killed Peter, Paul, and other Christians. Mark ultimately is writing for an audience of Roman Christians who have suffered great setbacks and rejection. This message that Mark is conveying to them would have been particularly powerful in the context through which they were living. These individuals, like Jesus, were horizontally rejected. In other words, rejected by the people, the rest of society. They were misunderstood. They were persecuted. And Mark's message is so powerful for them. It's a message that says, have hope. The way you're being treated is the same way that Jesus Christ was being treated. What matters ultimately is that God approves you, God accepts you, and God saves you. This message is also powerful for us today as well, perhaps especially at times when we feel we might be rejected by others or be having tense relationships with those around us. So let's now dig into this incredible gospel, and if you have your Bible, it's probably a good idea to get it out, to see really the genius of Mark. So we see the beginning of Mark's gospel begins with those famous words, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Mark's gospel, as I mentioned, has no infancy narrative. Mark's gospel begins immediately with the ministry of Jesus, the preaching of John the Baptist. Jesus is baptized himself. He is tempted. John is arrested. And then we find the very first words of Jesus in the gospel. So let's read these together. Mark chapter 1 verses 14 through 15. After John had been arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. This is the time of fulfillment. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. We have here in the very first words of Jesus Christ in the gospel of Mark, some very important terms. Jesus is saying that the gospel of God, he proclaims the gospel of God. This word gospel is so important in Greek, euangelion. Literally, literally it means good proclamation or good message. This word, word gospel or good news, euangelion, was not a term that New Testament writers like Mark invented. In the Roman Empire, the term euangelion or gospel was a term used to announce the birth of a new emperor, generally. The birth of a new emperor was called gospel, euangelion, or this word gospel was used to announce the victory of an emperor in battle. In the Septuagint as well, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which is the version of the Jewish scriptures that the New Testament writers would have used, this word euangelion, gospel, good news, is used to indicate some victorious action God works on behalf of Israel. Jesus then says, The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God, Jesus is saying, has arrived in his very person. When we put these two principles or concepts together, good news and gospel, we see that Jesus, what he is proclaiming is that a new kind of kingdom is being established in his very person. Jesus Christ, the gospel he comes to bring, is the message not of the birth of a new emperor, a Roman emperor, but the birth of a new kind of king and the inauguration of a new kind of kingdom, which is, of course, God's kingdom. The kingdom that Jesus comes to bring about is radically different. From the way that we can see that Jesus acts, we can see that the kingdom of God that Jesus comes to inaugurate is a kingdom where the poor and the weak are cared for, where justice is established, The kingdom that Jesus comes to bring about is radically different. Jesus himself also is a radically different kind of king. He does not take from people as other kings do through taxation, taking their goods so that he can live a good life. Rather, Jesus is a kind of king who gives his very life, gives himself up to death for the good of the people. The fact that the kingdom has come near in the person of Jesus requires a response. We see this in verse 15. The time of fulfillment is near. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Jesus' proclamation of the gospel requires repentance. In Greek, metanoiate, which literally means a change of thinking. This comes or is derived ultimately from the Hebrew verb shuv, which means to turn. 
to change your direction. In the Jewish context, people would have been used to these calls for repentance, this call to shuv, to metanoiate. Ultimately, this call to repentance was a call to return to the covenant between God and Israel. Jesus' words here are very significant. Repent and believe. These two words are kind of like two code words for the core of the Ten Commandments. A return to two things. A return to justice and a return to piety, right relationship with God. This was often the theme in kind of preaching at this time and reflected the two tablets of Moses' law, the law that, that uh, God gave Moses on Mount Sinai. Oftentimes the first tablet, table or tablet in the law had to do with our relationships with God in Greek, Eusebia. And the second table or tablet had to do with our relationships with our neighbor, Dikinosune, sorry, that's a tongue twister. Um, our relationships with those who are around us. Jesus ultimately in proclaiming the good news calls us to two kind of responses. A response that has to do with our relationship with God. We're called to follow God more closely in the person of Jesus and a response also that is horizontal, that has to do with how we relate to others, that we're called to work towards justice, to truly build up God's kingdom. As we move on then in Mark's gospel, we see that Jesus Christ proclaims the good news. Then Jesus goes on and he calls his disciples. Ultimately, then he goes to Capernaum to preach on the Sabbath. And then we begin to see how the good news that Jesus Christ begins to be accepted by some, but also rejected by many others. So if you want to follow along in your Bible, you can see Mark chapter 1, verses 21 through 38. This describes Jesus' day of ministry in Capernaum. So you can see on the map on your screen where Capernaum is located on the north of the Sea of Galilee. And it's a fascinating location even from archaeology where we've discovered some, well not we, but archaeologists have discovered some very interesting items there. So the top left image you can see here is the archaeological site of Capernaum today. And anybody, you can go visit it there. And on the bottom of that site, you can see a white building and you see an expanded view on the bottom left image on your screen. And this is a synagogue that was in Capernaum. Now this synagogue was actually from a later time of Jesus' life. This synagogue here was from the year around 300 AD, but archeologists have discovered under this synagogue, another synagogue or the remains of another synagogue where Jesus Christ would have actually preached where this gospel passage we're about to read took place. Now you can see kind of there on the archeological excavation, or the archaeological site on the top left, there's a building there that looks like the Millennium Falcon from Star Wars. And right under that Millennium Falcon, you can see on the right, the remains of what is the house of Peter. So Capernaum is a very exciting site that's only been discovered recently in the last, I think, 70 years or so, where they've actually discovered the site, the house of Peter, that was built up over time to be an ancient church. On this day of Jesus' ministry, we learn what activities are associated with the proclamation of God's kingdom. Teaching with authority, exercising demons, healing, having prayer interrupted, and we see ultimately that Jesus begins to encounter rejection. So let's read this day in Jesus' ministry together. Mark chapter 1, verse 21. Then they came to Capernaum, and on the Sabbath he entered, entered the synagogue and taught. So that would be perhaps that synagogue underneath the one we saw on the screen. The people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. In their synagogue was a man with an unclean spirit. He cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus rebuked him and said, Quiet, come out of him. The unclean spirit convulsed him, and with a loud cry came out of him. All were amazed and asked one another, What is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. His fame spread everywhere throughout the whole region of Galilee. On leaving the synagogue, he entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. 
Simon's mother-in-law lay sick with a fever. They immediately told him about her. He approached, grasped her hand, and helped her up. Then the fever left her, and she waited on them. When it was evening, after sunset, they brought to him all who were ill or possessed by demons. The whole town was gathered at the door. He cured many who were sick with various diseases, and he drove out many demons, not permitting them to speak because they knew him. Rising very early before dawn, he left and went off to a deserted place where he prayed. Simon and those who were with him pursued him. And on finding him, everyone is, and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. He told them, Let us go on to the nearby villages that I may preach there also. For this purpose I have come. So he went into their synagogues preaching and driving out demons throughout the whole of Galilee. Again, we can see here in this one day of Jesus' ministry, this first day of Jesus' ministry, the different activities that are associated with the proclamation of God's kingdom. Jesus teaches with authority. He exercises his demons. He heals those who are sick and in need. He tries to get away to prayer only to have his prayer interrupted. And slowly but surely, he encounters rejection. We see also in this passage the complexity that the coming of God's reign or kingdom entails. People need to convert. This metanoia is, is required. The presence of evil must be contravened. We find more and more throughout Mark's gospel that whenever Jesus proclaims this good news about a new kingdom, that he is a new king, his gospel more and more becomes opposed. So here in this passage, we saw that he was opposed by demons. Earlier, Jesus was opposed by Satan in verses 12 and 13. Later in the gospel, we will see that the scribes and Pharisees openly reject Jesus and his teachings. Even Jesus' own followers, those he handpicked to follow him, do not understand him. In some way, it's a bit of a rejection. Mark shows, and this is quite unique among all the evangelists, how the disciples have this incomprehension. They have fears. They ultimately were dispersed at his passion. Again, it's very different than other gospels. In fact, many people often remark that in Mark's gospel, the only thing that the disciples ever did right was leave their nets behind and follow Jesus in the first place. In this first day of Jesus' ministry, we find another fascinating detail of Mark's gospel. And this is closely connected to the idea, the idea of misunderstanding, opposition, and vindication that we find in Mark's gospel. This idea or concept is often known as the messianic secret, and maybe you've heard of that before. This messianic secret. Jesus in the gospel wants at different times to keep the fact that he is a Messiah, the Holy One of God, his identity a secret. This is called the Messianic secret. And we saw this in the passage that we just read. The demons know Jesus' identity, but Jesus commands them not to speak. So we need to ask ourselves, why would Jesus do this? And there's some good reasons for this. Probably one of the best reasons is that although the demons and other people later in the gospel use the correct titles for Jesus, they call him the Holy One of God, they call him the Messiah, they use the right titles, but they don't know what these titles mean in respect to Jesus. They call Jesus Messiah, but Jesus is trying to convey the idea with this messianic secret that who Jesus is as a Messiah, as a Savior, can only be appreciated in the light of the cross. This idea of the messianic secret also fits well into this genius of Mark that I've been describing, the way he alters in a very interesting way this bios genre. Jesus is not seeking recognition from people or especially from demons. Recognition from God is what is important. Therefore, Jesus does not go, need to go trumpeting his identity before all. We saw then in this first day of Jesus' ministry how the gospel is, in, is announced and is beginning to be opposed. I'd like to discuss a very, what I find fascinating and one of my favorite passages from Mark's gospel. And it's an episode that shows how the good news that Jesus proclaims is universal. It is meant for all. And also it shows that oftentimes the gospel that Jesus announces is accepted from people who we do not expect. So if you want to open your Bibles, the episode I want to read is taken from 
uh, Mark chapter 7, verses 24 through 30. So Mark 7, 24 through 30. This is Jesus' encounter with this Syrophoenician woman. And it is a puzzling passage for, for me, for many people. But as I said, it's become one of my favorites. So let's read together. Mark 7, 24. From that place, Jesus went off to the district of Tyre. He entered the house and wanted no one to know about it, but he could not escape notice. Soon a woman whose daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him. She came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to drive the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the food of the children and throw it to the dogs. She replied and said to him, Lord, even the dogs under the table eat the children's scraps. Then he said to her, For saying this you may go, the demon has gone out of your daughter. When the woman went home, she found the child laying in bed, and the demon gone. So again, as I said, this is a fascinating, a puzzling passage. Whenever I hear it, or I think whenever a lot of people hear it, the first thing you think is, did Jesus really call that woman a dog? That's one issue and aspect that we need to discuss. Another question we need to ask is, what was Jesus doing up there in Tyre? So on this map, you can see circled in red, the city of Tyre by the seacoast. And Jesus in going to Tyre is in a pagan, a Gentile neighborhood. It's not Jewish. And Jesus is very, very far from home. This passage of Jesus with the Syrophoenician woman is a very debated passage about what the meaning means. What actually is going on here? Some people read this passage as suggesting that the woman, the Syrophoenician woman, is somehow able to change the mind of Jesus to help him understand his mission differently, that he sent not just for the Jewish people, but for also Gentiles, for non-Jews. Others argue that perhaps Jesus is testing the woman in this passage, demanding some humility. Now, I'd like to briefly just um, go over a reading or an interpretation of this passage that's presented by Father Aletti again, and I think it's a very uh, wonderful reading of this passage because Father Aletti illustrates that in order to understand this passage, you need to understand the context of where it's found in Mark's gospel to see what is going on around it. And when we do this, when we look at the context of this interaction with this Syrophoenician woman, we find that this story happens in a place in the gospel where bread, bread like that you eat, is very, very important. So in verse 27, in Mark 7, 27, we hear in my translation, Jesus says, he talks about, it is not right to take the food of the children and throw it to the dogs. But in Greek, the term there is artos, which is bread. And bread, of course, is an important symbol in the Old Testament, also the New, symbolizing many things, God's wisdom, his care for his people, sustenance. We can think of, for example, manna in the desert. Now, this interaction with Jesus, where he's talking about bread with the Syrophoenician woman, is found smack dab between two other incidences where Jesus multiplies loaves or bread for huge crowds. So Mark's gospel is very interesting in this. There are two different accounts of when Jesus multiplies loaves. He does it twice for large crowds, but for very different kinds of crowds. So the first time Jesus multiplies loaves or bread happens before this incident with the Syrophoenician woman. Jesus feeds 5,000 people who are Jews. Okay, and there's 12 baskets left over. Later, after the passage with the Syrophoenician woman, uh, Jesus multiplies loaves, the bread again, for 4,000 people, and it's given to the Gentiles for non Jews. Jesus works this mir miracle in the Decapolis, a non Jewish area, area. So the two multiplication of the loaves are found. We have these two multiplications of the loaves, first to the Jews, then to the Gentiles. And in between, we find this episode with this Syrophoenician woman, where bread becomes very important. This sandwiching comp, uh, kind of rhetorical technique that Mark is using here is something that he uses often in his gospel, where you have one incident, and it's repeated in another time, and there's something in between. This is technically called intercalation, where he wraps one story around another. Some people call it a literary sandwich, right? So you have 
feeding of the 5,000, feeding of the 4,000. It's a sandwich with important content in between. And this is a very uh, interesting and elegant rhetorical technique where Mark is encouraging us to look more closely at these stories, to compare them, to contrast them, to see how they're different, and to pay what is attention to what is in the middle of it. Bread here, of course, is very important with this interaction with Jesus and the Syrophoenician woman. It's found between these two multiplications, first for the Jews, then for the Gentiles. This interaction with the Syrophoenician woman is like a hinge between these two multiplication uh, miracles. In their conversation, the conversation of Je Jesus and the Syrophoenician woman, there's talk about children and dogs getting food, getting bread. Children, of course, in the, in the Bible is used to indicate the people of Israel. We find this, for example, in the prophet Isaiah, chapter 30, verse 1, Hosea 11, verse 1. Dogs, on the other hand, is a slur that was common at that time for pagans, for Gentiles. It was used sometimes in some Jewish writings to express who pagans were. They were called dogs. It was not a polite term at all. Gentiles were seen as unclean, oftentimes the enemy of the Jewish people. We find this in an intertestamental uh, writing, First Enoch. Jesus, in calling this woman a dog, we need to ask ourselves, is he sharing this prejudice? Is he using this slur in this way? When we look closely, it doesn't look like Jesus is doing this at all. There's some reasons for this that, again, are very important based on the context. Immediately preceding this section, Jesus has just had a conversation about what food is clean and what food is unclean. Okay, this happens right before this biblical passage, starting around verse uh, 17. Jesus has a conversation about what food is clean and unclean, and Jesus ultimately says it's what comes out of a person that defiles them, not what type of food they eat. And in this way, Jesus proclaims that all food is clean. Just after this idea of talk of clean and unclean, Jesus then chooses to go to Tyre, a pagan territory. And it seems that Jesus is going there to illustrate that the pagans are not unclean. So Jesus goes there for a purpose to continue this teaching about what is clean and unclean. In the Greek also, when Jesus calls the woman a dog, he uses the diminutive term of using dog. Like he uses canarion, which is not kind of a wild dog that is out and about, but it is rather a household dog, a dog that is seen to be domesticated, part of the family. So what Jesus is doing here is taking a term of derision, a slur, and he's manipulating it to fill it with new meaning. We could almost hear Jesus' way of saying it to her. It's not right to take the food of the children and, and, and throw it to the dogs. He's kind of provoking her, asking her to think about things in a new way. So Jesus is taking a slur, but he's changing its meaning, already showing that this woman is not a dog in the way that people have been using it at that time, because she's already part of the household. She's very much part of the household of God and will soon be even more so made part of the household. Further, in Jesus' way of interacting with this woman, we see many similarities with other miracles. When Jesus interacts with other people who receive healing, for example, these people often display a kind of doggedness, we could say. For example, Jairus, when he tries to get his daughter healed, or the way with the woman with the hemorrhage interacts with Jesus in, in chapter 5. This way of, of interacting with the people, Jesus tries to draw out a deeper faith in them. And we see this clearly in the Syrophoenician woman. We see this fascinating sequence then in Mark's gospel where this story is found. Jesus first provides bread for the Jews. He multiplies the loaves. The Jews, again, are the children. Jesus then has a conversation about what is clean and unclean, and he declares all foods clean. Jesus then goes to Tyre, where he intends to extend his mission to the pagans, to the Gentiles, to show that they are not unclean. And he begins this mission ultimately with the Syrophoenician woman. And he will extend this mission further when he multiplies the loaves for the pagans shortly in the, Deca the Decapolis. In this interaction then with the woman, he is testing her in some ways to seeing if, he, if she understands his mission Jesus comes to provide bread, that is assistance life, to the Jews and to the pagans. 
They are all called to be part of God's family. The Syrophoenician woman is not some dog out there as other people might have used it as a slur. Jesus is saying she's already intimately part of the family. The kingdom of God, the gospel is for all people. It includes all. And of course, this passage has an important message for us in our life as disciples. We cannot fence Jesus or the gospel in. The good news of Jesus, his salvation that he brings and offers is for all people. And we find here a surprising truth that we often experience in life. People who we do not expect to kind of get the message of Jesus often do and can show even greater faith than us. Following Jesus' encounter with the Syrophoenician woman in chapter 7, chapters 8 and 9 of Mark's gospel is a turning point in Jesus' mission and ministry. Up until this point in the gospel, <clears throat> Jesus has been preaching in parables. He's been healing people. And we see more and more that he's encountering resistance. This gospel that he proclaims is being opposed in, in stronger and stronger ways. In verse 8 and 9, however, we see in chapters 8 and 9, we see a great shift. Now Jesus begins to boldly proclaim the necessity of his suffering, death, and resurrection. Jesus totally changes his mes message and when he does this, his disciples become increasingly confused. Also in these chapters 8 and 9, and I have a picture there on the screen, is the transfiguration, which is meant to be a kind of preview to the glory of the resurrection. In chapters 8 and 9, we see a change also, a rather dramatic change, in the location of the gospel. Up until this point, Jesus has been operating in the north of Israel, in Galilee, mostly. We see he goes to Tyre. He spends a lot of his time in Capernaum there by the house of Peter. But now Jesus turns his direction and he begins his long walk towards Jerusalem, towards his passion. So you can see that with the arrow on the map. <clears throat> this change in the Gospel of Mark is absolutely essential for us to understand who Jesus is. Now I mentioned earlier when we were talking about the messianic secret, Jesus wants to keep the fact that he is a Messiah a secret because you cannot understand Jesus' mission and his message outside of the cross. We need to see Jesus on the cross. We need to see and experience the passion in order to understand who Jesus is, what he does for us. This has ultimately a critical lesson for our life as disciples. We can, of course, learn much from the parables and teachings of Jesus. But we must understand that victory ultimately comes through the passion and death of Jesus. We grow as disciples when we too and suffer the, uh, encounter the cross and suffering. Jesus then, for the remainder of Mark's gospel, makes his way towards Jerusalem. Till now, he has proclaimed the good news, the kingdom of God. Jesus has shown that he is a radical kind of king. He is a king who is for all people, but at the same time, he has been rejected. And along the way, his messianic identity has been kept a secret. Now ultimately comes the climatic moment when all is revealed and all is made clear. The passion and cross in Mark's gospel are central to his gospel account. And it takes up almost, well, over half of Mark's gospel when you count it out. So the passion and the cross is so central for Mark's gospel. There's a famous um, uh, quotation from the 19th century scholar Martin Kaler. And he famously described that Mark's gospel essentially is, quote, a passion narrative with an extended introduction. So he's saying here ultimately this, this fact, that, which is very true. The crucifixion, the passion of Jesus is what is most central to the gospel. And there's also other material. But we've seen, of course, that it's not just an introduction. It's central to explaining Jesus' mission, what is happening at the gospel. But it is true then from chapter 8 onwards the gospel ultimately is about the passion of Jesus and his disciples' inability to grasp it. The way that the crucifixion of Jesus is portrayed in Mark is very profound, deliberate, and a very beautiful theological exposition. It is ultimately a climax of this theme we've been talking about, this theme where Jesus is rejected by the people, where he does not receive that horizontal recognition but ultimately, Jesus is accepted by God. So let's read here together. Um, you can open your Bibles to chap verse chapter sorry, uh, 15, 
and we're going to read from verse 22. So 1522. The crucifixion and death of Jesus in Mark's gospel is conveyed in three distinct scenes. These scenes are marked by hour indicators. So the third hour, the sixth hour, and the ninth hour. In some Bibles, they've put in what is our time. So that'd be 9, 12, 9 o'clock in the morning, 12, and 3 p.m. And as these scenes progress in time, the sense of tragedy, rejection grows. This sense of darkness grows while Jesus is on the cross. Throughout Jesus' time on the cross, there's numerous Old Testament allusions to sufferings. of. Um, in the Old Testament, we often find just persons who are suffering uh, for no cause, but who are ultimately accepted by God. And Mark has a lot of these allusions to get across the idea that Jesus is like the righteous people in the Psalms and elsewhere in the Old Testament who are persecuted unjustly, but ultimately vindicated by God. So Jesus, for example, as we'll read shortly, has wine offered to him on the cross. We find this in Proverbs 32 or Psalm 69, where we see a righteous person who's suffering unjustly and is offered wine. And Jesus has his clothes divided, just like the righteous suffer in Psalm 22. So let's read together here the crucifixion account of Jesus. Um, it's Matthew again, Mark, Mark 15, starting from, well, it started at 20, 21. They pressed into service a passerby, Simon a Cyrian, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. They brought Jesus to the place of Golgotha, which is translated place of the skull. They gave him wine and drugged him with myrrh, and he did not take it. Then they crucified him and divided his garments by casting lots for them to see what each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. With him they crucified two revolutionaries, one on his right and one on his left. Those passing by reviled him, shaking their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself by coming down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests with the scribes mocked him along with the others and said, He saved others. He can, why can he not save himself? Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also kept abusing him. So we see here what we just heard is that first scene, that first period on the cross, which is the earliest, nine o'clock in the morning. We see in this scene that Jesus is mocked by passersby, chief priests and scribes, and even those co-crucified criminals. Then we come to the second scene. It is very short, but very dramatic. Verse 31. At noon, darkness came across the whole land until three in the afternoon. That is it. It's simple, it's short, but it is very gloomy. It is very dramatic. Darkness has come across the land. And then now we come to the third scene, the third time period. We see a growing of this sense of foreboding and dread. And at three o'clock, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of the bystanders who heard it said, Look, he is calling Elijah. One of them ran, soaked a sponge with wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see if Elijah comes to take him down. Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. So we see in this third scene, the drama, the sense of rejection, foreboding, grows and grows. The sense of darkness grows. Jesus, when he ultimately speaks on the cross, does so to say the first words from the Psalm 22, but in Aramaic. In this, he expresses desperation to God. He calls on God for desperation and receives no answer. There is only silence. This is one of the Psalms, as we saw from the Song of the Righteous Sufferer person in the Psalms. This darkness then grows while Jesus is on the cross until he finally gives a loud cry and breathes his last. It would seem ultimately now at this point, if we just left it here, that things are hopeless, that Jesus has proclaimed his gospel about the kingdom. He's a new king bringing a new kingdom. 
ultimately there's this rejection and it's final. But already in Mark's gospel, and this is so important, already in the gospel there is this unexpected vindication of Jesus on the cross. It doesn't have to wait to the resurrection. Jesus in Mark's gospel is already vindicated on the cross. He's given victory by God in the midst of this darkness. So after all this opposition throughout his life, victory comes for Jesus after his death. Now remember, as we discussed before, in a bios, in this Greco-Roman biography, it was generally about someone who was recognized as great by the people, received horizontal recognition. But for Mark throughout his gospel, he's been showing us that this is not what is important. What is important is this vertical recognition that Jesus Christ, although he is rejected by other people, is vindicated and accepted by God in his person and in his mission. So how then does Mark show that Jesus receives vindication at his death? How does he convey this? Let's read together, looking at uh, verse 38. So we saw in 37, Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And then in 38, the veil of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. When the centurion who stood facing him saw how he had breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. There were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of the younger James and of Jose and Salome. These women had followed him when he was in Galilee and ministered to him. There were also many other women who had come up with him from Jerusalem. We find here, right after Jesus' death, while he is still on the, on the cross, two very significant details uh, recorded or narrated here by Mark. First, the veil is torn, verse 37. In this tearing of the veil, and we see an image there on the screen, the temple is deprived of holiness. Okay, Jesus already talked about that this would happen. But also significantly, Jesus said that this would happen uh, in his trial. In his trial in chapter 14, the very thing he's accused of is speaking against the temple. Here, when Jesus dies, he is proved right by God. It's clearly that who is God, who is ripping the veil in the sanctuary. Therefore, God is proving Jesus right in what he had said would happen. Here in this scene, God vindicates Jesus and his mission. It shows that Jesus was telling the truth. He is who he said he was. The second important scene, and we see it there depicted on the right on the screen, a Gentile, a centurion, recognizes a truth about Jesus that the high priest in his trial could not. And the centurion expresses this truth. Truly, this man was the son of God. So here in the centurion saying this, truly, this man was the son of God, we find that an outsider has given their approval, their act of faith to Jesus in a similar way than the Syrophoenician woman did. This victory that begins with Jesus on the cross is ultimately co continued in the resurrection account of Mark's gospel. Here now we come to a very famous and significant aspect of Mark's gospel. Namely, the question of where does Mark's gospel end? Where did Mark's gospel originally end? So if you have your Bibles with you and you open to chapter 16, normally a lot of Bibles will indicate after 16 verse 8. Um, the rest of what follows in chapter 16 might be in brackets, or it might have headings that say, longer ending or shorter ending. What's going on here? Well, what's happening is in that the oldest Greek manuscripts we have of Mark all end with 16.8. That's where Mark's gospel ends in these ancient, most ancient Greek manuscripts. So let's read this, what appears perhaps to be the original ending in Mark's gospel. When the Sabbath was over, so this is 16 verse 1, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. Very early when the sun had risen, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb. They were saying to one another, Who will roll back the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. On entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a white robe, 
and they were utterly amazed. He said to them, Do not be amazed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, the crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go and tell his disciples and Peter, He is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him as he told you. Then they went out and fled from the tomb, seized with trembling and bewilderment. They said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. So as I mentioned here, in the earliest Greek manuscripts, this here is where the Gospel of Mark ends. And now as we listen to this, this might seem like a rather abrupt ending. There is no actual appearance of the risen Christ. Some Christians might have made, then went on to make what they thought perhaps uh, was a short um, or abrupt ending to be more suitable. So the best known of these endings then are found in other manuscripts, and they're recorded usually in our Bibles in chapter 16, verses 9 through 20. These are sometimes called the longer endings or the shorter endings of Mark and Sister at the beginning of the lesson today or the beginning of this reflection today, read from one of these longer endings, which we find in the gospel today for St. Mark. So what is going on here? Why is it that the oldest manuscripts end on 16 verse 8? There are two possibilities. The first possibility, there was an original longer ending that got lost before our oldest manuscripts were copied. In this case, or if this is the case, we have no way of knowing how the Gospel of Mark ended. Okay, that's one possibility. Or a second possibility, and as I'm going to explain, this is probably the more likely case, Mark deliberately ended his Gospel at 16.8 for some rhetorical or theological effect. Mark deliberately ended the gospel at 16.8. And there seems to be very good reasons in support of this. Now, remember, Jesus is already vindicated and recognized by God. This happened on the cross. He's given vertical recognition on the cross. And also by this young man, this angel who appears, he proclaims, he's a messenger from God, and proclaims that Jesus Christ is risen. No more vindication from God is required. The gospel ultimately has a neat ending in how Mark has subverted that bios genre. And this is something that Father Aledi argues. Throughout, of course, the gospel of Mark, Mark is trying to show how horizontal recognition, recognition from the people is not important, only recognition from God. And this has already happened, both on the cross and in this initial account of the young man telling these women at the tomb that Jesus is risen. The gospel is already finished. It is complete. It is nicely tied up. There is another very important and profound reason why Mark perhaps ended his gospel at 16.8. Mark probably ends his gospel where he does because he leaves it up to the reader to determine how it will finish. Mark wants the reader to make a choice to see how the gospel is going to continue in their own life. That's why he ends it here. The scholar Mark Powell explains it very well, and I quote, Mark chooses to end the tale at what, for his readers, in the, is a critical juncture. He ends with a, quote, altar call, so to speak, for the readers need to decide whether they want to continue this story when they weigh their own faithlessness to Jesus against his faithfulness. To them, will they respond as the disciples did? Mark Powell goes on to explain, wants his readers to realize that the story is not over. It cannot be over yet. The readers need to ask themselves when hearing this ending, so what does it mean? What happens next? What now? And this really is the question I'd like to leave with each of us here this evening as disciples. This is the question for us. When we read Mark's gospel, we read about Jesus' proclamation of the good news this new kind of kingdom that's radically different, a kingdom of justice where the poor, the marginalized are taken care of. We hear about Jesus' proclamation that he is a new kind of king who gives his entire life for us. We hear that there is a call for repentance, metanoite. We need to change our lives so that we can live within this kingdom. We're given a mission to follow Jesus, just like the early disciples, to build up this kingdom. And it's a call or following that involves the cross in our life as it did for Jesus. We hear that Jesus is rejected by some, but we hear ultimately at the end of this gospel 
this report of this young man, this messenger for God, that Jesus Christ has risen, and we're left with the answer that we need to question we need to ask ourselves, how now will we respond? How will we continue the gospel and its proclamation in the world? So I thank you very much. And I hopefully now we'll be able to reconnect here with sister and answer some of your questions, if you have some, and if I can answer them. Thank you so, so much, Father Nick. Thank you very much. What a wonderful question you leave us at the end. Um, you know, so what do we do with what we heard? What is our role in our world today? And how do we ourselves go out and proclaim this beautiful um, message that we have heard? Uh, so there are a few questions, Father Nick, that came in while you were talking. Um, all right. Um, okay, this is in relation to what you shared about the reaping of the veil at uh, the temple. And the question says, do you think that the cruci at the crucifixion, the veil was ripped in half from top to bottom to signify that, yes, the humanity of Jesus is gone, yet his divinity remains? Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. I think that, yeah, to how would we answer that, right? So I would want to see, like, okay, what evidence from the text can we find that can respond to that question? So... Certainly, as I was explaining this ripping of the veil of the temple, that veil was, of course, to signify the division between the Holy of Holies and the rest of the temple. So in the ripping of the veil, it signifies certainly that uh, the temple is, that the holiness of the sanctity of the temple is, is gone at that moment. And we know that earlier in the gospel, Jesus announced that that would happen. Mm -hmm. So at his, at his trial, this is one of the things he's accused of. So this is a reading or interpretation that I would say is, certain because of yeah evidence we find in the text that other reading is interesting i mean jesus always maintains his humanity yeah he never leaves it um yeah i mean it, it could be like that there's uh, something going on there but i i don't i wouldn't see evidence in the text for that mm -hmm. thank you it could then, be but i'm not seeing it <laughs> <laughs> um there is some question in relation to um the effect of the ending of the Gospel of Mark. So can you please explain again, they say the theological effect and the reason why the different endings. Right, right. Um, so maybe a quick. Um, yeah, I mean, the endings of Mark is always something like since I've been like, I think we all find puzzling. Like if we pick mm -hmm. up any Bible, we'll find there like longer ending, shorter ending. So what's going on here? And then when you read footnotes from a good study Bible, it'll tell you mm -hmm. that the reality is, is the oldest Greek manuscripts we have end at chapter 16 verse 8. So mm -hmm. there's two possibilities is that Mark had a different ending and it was lost before our older manuscripts. Mm -hmm. That's one possibility in which case we'll never know it or that Mark meant to stop there for a reason. But what these other manuscripts come from is that other scribes or early Christians to we would see this also as workings of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit mm -hmm. continues to work within the church have added other interpretations uh, readings of, of how this would end, and we see the rest of it there. But I was arguing that uh, I think, or scholar, many scholars argue that it's significant and important that Mark ended there for rhetorical and theological reasons. Mm -hmm. And those reasons are two. One argued by Father Aletti is that, okay, the purpose of this gospel was to show Jesus' vindication, acceptance by God, mm -hmm. and that has happened. It's actually a very beautiful closing of the boat. Jesus mm -hmm. is, like, everything is wrapped up. Jesus Christ is accepted, is shown to be accepted by God on the cross already. That's what I find so beautiful. Like it's out of darkness that victory comes already. Jesus is vindicated on the cross. And then this young man, this heavenly messenger says Jesus is written. So in some ways the gospel is done, mm -hmm. right? However, it's also this beautiful um, response, like a very good work of literature engages the reader in some way, challenges them, provokes them. And what, what he's saying is like, okay, that's what I have to say. Now, how will you respond? Mm -hmm. What will you do? How will you continue this story? Back to us. Yeah. 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 Um, Father Nick, what is the title of the book of this uh, Father Aleti that you keep mentioning? Yeah. Just a moment. It's mm -hmm. uh, I think the birth of the Gospels as... Um, the birth of the Gospels as biographies. So Father Letty was a Jes is it was a Jesuit, um, a scholar in 
uh, well, the Biblicum, the school I went to in Rome. So I mm -hmm. suppose I'm partial. Wonderful. But it's very beautiful. And, and also that reading from the uh, Syrophoenician woman is mm -hmm. kind of a narrative reading that he gave that I think is a very, uh, yeah, interesting yeah. and compelling explanation of that. that very insight. much so. Yes, yeah. So another question asks, uh, what would you suggest for us lay people to include the gospel, I guess, maybe how? How would you suggest for us lay people to include the gospel of Mark, his examples and witnesses in a regular conversation when we evangelize people? Right. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think part of it is, is like just that we read the gospel of Mark. Is like, like I said, it's an hour and a half. Um, yeah, maybe like we could have just read it. We could have got maybe more than what I had to say, but like that gospel, just to read it because it's compelling. And I remember the first time I read the gospel of Mark just in one sitting, mm -hmm. like it's, it's very gripping. You see what Jesus is, how he's conveyed that story that is there, um, how we would use it in our conversation with people. I mean, I think that um, one thing that comes to mind is that correspondence between the way that Jesus is portrayed and the initial audience. And I think that's helpful that it seems very likely that this audience that is being addressed is persecuted, is rejected, right? It's, it's Rome at this time of persecutions. And the message is so incredible and uplifting. And I think for anybody that we're, say, evangelizing, being in conversation with, who is suffering, mm -hmm. right? That look, like, like Jesus went through the same thing as you. He too was rejected. He too was abandoned. But ultimately what was important in his life is that God accepted him. Yes. And same too for us. God accepts us. God loves us. So that message, I think, like, yeah, that was that message was compelling for the original audience. And so today, like the gospel seems to be most compelling for those who need to hear that message of liberation, of salvation. Mm -hmm. And yeah, early Christians were oftentimes women or slaves because of that, right? That mm -hmm. those who need that message of liberation, of of to hear that God loves them, accepts them, has chosen them, uh, will, I think, respond very strongly. Yeah, like that, that's a very compelling aspect of the Gospel of Mark, in my opinion. Yeah, maybe this is a, a question that ties into what you were just um, explaining. So um, she's asking, is, are there any information about how the Gospel of Mark was received and used by the early Christians? Um, well, probably a lot. Mm -hmm. I, can't, I mean, the, the one thing off the top of my head is the fact that we have these different endings Mm -hmm. shows the, that's like what we would call in the reception history in biblical studies like it's very important to see how how a text is received in a community and and those like we have active ongoing reception history already in the gospel that we have so that's one indication of it but again like okay i would just go back to that early audience like this was written for an audience who was being persecuted in rome or knew strongly of that persecution and from this time forward, persecution is only going to become worse with ongoing, okay, at that time it was Nero, it was more localized, but persecution of Christians is going to increase and become more spread throughout the empire as time goes on. So because of that, I would assume that the message would be more and more compelling. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Father. Um, the next question says, being, uh, being the Gospel of Mark notoriously ended strange, oops, mm -hmm. I lost it, um, we come to a strange and disconcerning Easter amid the, the novel, the COVID-19. How can you relate the pandemic to the Gospel of Mark? Yeah, um, yeah I mean, I, I, I think maybe, like, I would have to think about that more. I think it's yeah. really a good question. But I, I think it goes down to, like, could the Gospel of Mark is one that was written originally for people who feel abandoned, mm -hmm. who are suffering. And I think, especially at this time, that's something that we too can hear. We are cut off yeah. from people as the, uh, the original people who the gospel was written for. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a lot of suffering, both physical, mental, right? Spiritual suffering that we're cut off. But to have that hope that just as Jesus, what was important was that God loved and accepted him, validated his mission. So too, we can take hope in this at the time that mm -hmm. yeah, ultimately what's important is, is the way God looks at us, loves us and cares for us. Mm -hmm. I also think that, um, you know, you were speaking so beautifully about how the gospel is proclaimed and you spoke about the teaching with authority and healing and prayer. And I think, you know, that's what we can do at this time uh, ourselves. Mm -hmm. We look out for the people most in need and reach out right. to them right. and in for them and bring in that comfort and consolation. So to learn from our Lord mm -hmm. as we um, leave during this time that is very difficult. 
Right, right. Um, okay, so about Mark's family. If Mark and Barnabas were cousin, did Mark also come from Cyprus like Barnabas did? Yeah, so I, I purposely didn't get too much into the authorship of Mark. Um, it, and it is even in the tradition of the church debated who is Mark, right? So if you pick up any good introductory textbook or even your, like a, a good study Bible, you'll find information about authorship in Mark. Um, yeah, ultimately, uh, the identity of the author of, of Mark's gospel is anonymous. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say this, but we have like early Christian tradition, early manuscripts in their inscriptions. They started mm -hmm. to ascribe it to Mark. So there were different people, different Marks in, in the other New Testament that they ascribed it to. Mm -hmm. So to get into that sort of detailed question, I mean, there might be traditions about that, but we don't get that information from Mark's gospel. Mm -hmm. uh, another question is, is there a significance to Mark eleven fourteen? I would I would have to look and see what eleven fourteen is. Let's see. Right. I'm looking at it too. I have, I have not memorized the Bible. I'm afraid. Eleven fourteen. Okay, so the cursing of the fig tree. I'm I, I'm I'm sure there is significance. I'm <laughs> I have I'm not in the position to kind of talk about. I'd have to I'd have to look into that. That answer passage. yet to come. But, that is just fine. There are so many others. But a um, wonderful. Um, and that's another example of that intercalation, the sandwich. Mm -hmm. Jesus yeah. talks about the fig tree right there, it comes back, does something, and then the fig tree is talked about again. Mm -hmm. So again, like in, in interpreting this, it'd be a first step would be to compare it later on in verse 20 with the second thing, what's happening there. Mm -hmm. uh... Oh, they're asking if you could please um, do a talk on the other Gospels also. So <laughs> we'll, we'll schedule for sure. that. Sounds fun. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay. Um, I always thought that Christ's comment to the Seraphonician woman was a bit tongue-in-cheek. Do you think Christ used humor? Oh, yeah. Definitely. And I think, I think, I think the person asking this question is, is really yeah. onto something there. Like, I tried to say it in the way I, I, I was phrasing it, like, um, it's not right to give the food to the dogs, is it? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's definitely tongue in cheek. Jesus is taking what was a slur at that time that she would have known about, but he's changing it. He doesn't agree with it yeah. because we can tell that by the, by, by the, by the surroundings. And also that Greek word, he, he doesn't use dogs, like, like kind of a uh, big dog, but little dog and not meaning like puppy, but a domesticated dog. So he's already changing the meaning of it. And it's certainly like, yeah, there's a lot, he's not using it in the same way, he's already changing it. So mm -hmm. he's in the way of saying, you could see it as a bit like dog, like, you know, like kind of, you, we can't read in inflection into his voice here, but you could imagine something like that happening. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's a lot of humor in the Bible that we don't necessarily pick up often. As yeah. Easily, yeah. Uh, the next question is, the book of Mark, uh, the Gospel of Mark, is not only a synoptic gospel, but a primary source for the Gospel of Matthew and Luke, mm -hmm. plus source Q. Can you discuss this? Yeah, so I, what the questioner is getting at here is what we would call the synoptic problem. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially like when we look at the synoptic gospels, and that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're called synoptic because they look at the life of Jesus with the same eye. That's what synoptic means. And when we look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there are aspects of those three Gospels on the textual level that are so similar that it sh they that okay that they're identical pieces in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. That's called the triple tradition. And then there's aspects that are similar in Matthew and Luke that are not found in Mark. So that's the evidence that's there. And there's different you know theories or explanations to account for this. And the one of the main popular theories out there is the two source theory so that mark and luke had um sorry matthew and luke had mark's gospel when they were writing it and used that material that accounts for the triple source tradition and the double source tradition where does that come from they they suppose this q source doesn't we've never found it anywhere it's a hypothesis it helps explain things but ultimately like who cares like what is why is it important well it's important because if we know that Mark came first, then it's very fascinating to see the differences mm 
that Mar Matthew and Luke make on their source material of Mark. And a fascinating one to look at is in the first chapter of Mark, if you were to compare the healing of Simon Peter's mother-in-law in Mark, Matthew, and Luke, there's some very interesting differences, both in how it's conveyed in that short verses and where it comes in the gospel. And so we call that redaction uh, analysis to mm -hmm. see how Matthew and Luke use their source mark. We can learn so much about their theology. And for that reason, this discussion of like two source theory becomes quite important. If we can think, if we can argue that Mark came first, Matthew and Luke use them as a source, then we can make some very interesting investigations about Matthew and Luke's theology. Mm -hmm. Uh, always uh, on the same topic, it says, then if Mark came first, why do the other Gospels change Jesus' last words? Yeah, so, I mean, uh, in different Gospels, Jesus says different things on the mm -hmm. cross, right? And, I mean, it's very beautiful when we do these reflections of, like, the seven last words that happens often, you know, in Holy Week, and mm -hmm. to reflect on that. But the reality is, is like, okay, Jesus certainly is dying on the cross as these traditions that the gospel writers are taking. But the gospels are not like newspaper reports of people standing there watching. The gospel writers receive traditions and they shape it. They're, they're, they're concerned to convey the theological significance of what Jesus is doing. And because of this, Jesus has different words on the cross. So John has a lot. Jesus says different things. I thirst. It is finished. There is no cry of abandonment of Jesus on the cross. Right? So, the answer to that question is that different gospel writers are concerned to convey different theology about what is happening to Jesus while he's on the cross. Mm -hmm. And because of this, they're indicating different last words of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's, it's, the church has always known that the gospels are different mm -hmm. and has always been against attempts to try to harmonize them. Mm -hmm. There's contradictions in the gospels. Mm -hmm. Jesus cleanses the temple first in John, last in the synoptics. The church knows this, yeah but they all convey a beautiful picture of who Jesus is and we need all of them. And in the mm -hmm. church fathers, you hear about the quadriform gospel that the four together are this beautiful portrayal of Jesus Christ for us. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you. Um, and this is an interesting question too. Um, Father Nicky says, if the gospel of Mark can be characterized by the words announced, opposed and vindicated, would you be able to describe the other three gospels in a similar number of words? Not right now. I mean, I just chose those words because I thought they sounded like a bit compelling. <laughs> you have to come up with a flashy tale, but I do think that that's the plot of them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, every gospel has a different portrayal. Like, I mean, Luke, like off the top of my head, the, like Mo Matthew, Jesus is this new Moses. And I think mm -hmm. that's very significant throughout. Um, Luke, we have to always read Luke's gospel with Acts of the Apostles. It's mm -hmm. one work. So we see that Jesus does something and it's continued in the life of the church and Acts of the Apostles. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think, yeah, the, the, the great um, significance and, of Luke. And then John, Jesus is portrayed quite differently, right? Like Jesus mm -hmm. is, is very glorious, a very explicit indication of Jesus' divinity. Jesus on the cross is in glory. He's not, he's not like the suffering is downplayed. So I, I can't do it in those few words, I'm afraid. We'll have to schedule you for the other three Gospels right, and sure. then we can okay. hear uh, the answer. Sounds, sounds good. Yeah. Uh, would Mark have met Jesus personally? Uh, it does not seem, well, again, mm -hmm. there's no indication in, of, of biographical detail of who wrote it here, right? So it's speculation and there's different, um, there is different, but Mark was, is in tradition more linked to the testimony of Peter. Mm -hmm. Just as Luke was linked in tradition to the testimony of Paul, and then Matthew and John were seen as apostles. So there was no, even in the tradition, yeah. Mark is, it was seen to be the one who is recording or um, articulating Peter's um, yeah, witness and experience of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have time for a few more questions here. Okay. Uh, could the centurion be the same one that asked Jesus to cure his servant because he knew that Jesus had a worthy. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's again, like how, how would we argue for that? We'd have to find some evidence in the text. And I, I don't see, like there could be evidence in the gospel, but I, I don't see it mm -hmm. in the end there. Just as a centurion, which there are many. Yeah. I mean, it's a fascinating thing to consider. And I think quite... Mm -hmm effective like say for prayer or personal reflection mm 
But if that's what Mark intended, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. And then if Mark is writing for the early Christian in Rome, why did, does he write his gospel in Greek rather than in Latin? Right. Yeah, so um, Greek is the lingua franca mm -hmm. of, the, of the Roman Empire. So yeah. Latin would have been used by, like, so lingua franca, meaning the common language of people. Mm -hmm. So uh, definitely, like, in, in Jews, especially in the diaspora, meaning outside, like, uh, are speaking Greek. And they're reading mm -hmm. the Jewish scriptures in the Septuagint version. So Greek is the common language, not Latin. Mm -hmm. Latin would have been spoken, yeah, in some areas in Rome. But if we're thinking that um, the, the, the Christian community there are, okay, Christians, obviously early Jews, maybe outsiders mm -hmm. there as well. L Greek is still the common language of that time. Mm -hmm. And all New Testament texts are written in Greek because of that. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, a few more in here. Okay, Jesus seems to test people's faith before performing a miracle. Was mm. Jesus testing the woman's faith before healing her daughter? Yeah, certainly. And, and I was trying to um, express that a bit that, yeah, through, in many healing accounts, we can consider, for example, the woman who's hemorrhaging blood, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah, test or maybe a way to think about it. Like Jesus, he, puts a, he kind of puts a barrier there to try to draw out the depths of her faith that he already mm -hmm. sees, you know, like to try to, uh, yeah, we could say test, but ultimately it's, it's to help her express this faith that she mm -hmm. understands. Um, yeah. What Jesus's mission is about and his mm -hmm. identity, but certainly, yeah, there, there are many things going on and, and one would be that. And ultimately that this Syrophoenician woman an outsider becomes this incredible example of faith, mm -hmm. this deep faith that the disciples often lack. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what would be a good um, Bible with a good footnotes? Yeah, so the one I recommend is the Catholic Study Bible, and I'll hold it up. It's the one I've been reading. So it's this one, Catholic Study Bible. It's published by um, Oxford University Press. The translation is the New American Bible Revised Edition. But the footnotes are, like, what I like about it is the footnotes are mm -hmm. excellent. Um, there is a wonderful reading guide in the beginning of this book that they should be paying me money for this sister to advertise mm -hmm. this, this reading guide that gives a wonderful like help to in all the books of the Bible, like an overview of the main themes, characteristics. Mm -hmm. And then before each book, there's a very good introduction. And then the reason it's called Catholic is that they have some very good Catholic biblical scholars who write about like mm -hmm. the background of the Bible, of the Old Testament background, New Testament background. Also like the use of the Bible in liturgy, it gives a wonderful explanation. There's an article, some articles there about Catholic um, documents relating to scripture. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think it's a very good one. Another good one is always like the Oxford annotated is, is one you would probably use in a college class that's it's non-denominational or something, but mm -hmm. I, 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 I'm quite, I, I quite find this one, I find this one quite helpful. Hmm. Very good. Someone was asking about your beautiful artwork too that you shared. If there was a possibility for you to share some of the names and the artists, oh. I mean that would require a lot of work on my part. Yeah. I, I just, to be honest, I do Google image search with <laughs> um, the the licensing on reusable and shareable. Um, yes. I just, just kind of find things that are striking. I, I apologize. I, I don't know hmm. a lot of them, but I just find images that I find kind of compelling. But I, I unfortunately know very little about art, um, but I just see things that I find kind of beautiful and mm -hmm. kind of help to illustrate what's happening. Very good. I might be able to put something out there in a follow-up email for people to, who came. So we'll do a little bit. Uh, but as Father said, you know, you Google the images and there are so, so many beautiful ones that you can find. Um, okay, maybe I'll pick up another one. Um, Okay, Matthew's account of the healing of the Gentile's daughter presents the mother's request being put off four times, either by Jesus or the disciples. The mother persists in coming back over and over again, begging that her daughter be delivered to the demon. Her persistence is a good example for all of us not to give up in our request to Jesus. I guess this is um, more of a comment than a question as I got to the end of it. Um, 
but definitely the the importance of being persistent in our prayer i think is mm -hmm. shown throughout the gospels yeah so sorry about that father it was more of a comment um yeah, very very good mm -hmm. insight into that yeah um I think we address most of this. Um, in Mark's gospel, both the bandits crucified with him insulted Jesus. But in the other gospels, the one crucified to his right asked him to bring him to paradise. Mm -hmm. How is it contradicting with the other gospel? And that's our last question. Is there a contradiction there? Um, I mean, in, in that example, doesn't mm -hmm. seem so right like mm -hmm. one records what he says one us and i mean they still are both mocking so i guess in that way you could see it i mean i think the important thing to realize is that like and and the church documents on this are quite clear whether it's de verbum or whether mm -hmm. it's it's um uh, the church as mother and teacher mm -hmm. is that yeah the gospels are coming in the third stage of okay you have jesus in his life you have apostolic preaching and then the evangelists the gospel writers so the gospel writers, of course, are talking about historical events, mm -hmm. but the gospel writers are not trying to primarily give like a newspaper account of what happened or the, sitting there with a camcorder. Like mm -hmm. they're actually trying to do something much more beautiful and profound. And that is, is to not just say what is happening, but to give the theological significance and what it means for us. Mm -hmm. So that's why these differences are there. We're not, and the church has always been aware of these differences. And has always wanted to accept for and have resisted these when we get into these conversations about like contradict it's we, we start thinking like we need to harmonize them which we are not supposed to do we're supposed to read mm -hmm. each gospel um, as its own wonderful like i said it was trying to convey the beginning painting of jesus yeah. and all the gospels we need because of this complementary painting of christ mm -hmm. Thank you so very much, Father Nick. Thank you very much for um, sure. your time and for your beautiful explanation. And uh, and yes, we'll try to get you again with some of the other Gospels, hopefully soon, as there seems to be many, many requests. How beautiful that we uh, strive so, so deeply to understand better um, the words of our Lord. Uh, maybe we can conclude, Father, if you could please give us a blessing to end this sure. night on the Feast of St. Mark's sure. and the Vigil of the Third Sunday of Easter. Thank you sure. so much. So we pray in the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Loving, loving God, we thank you for this time we've had here together. We ask that you send your Holy Spirit to be with us, to bless each one of us, especially those who might be suffering in a particular time. Uh, during this time of the pandemic, from loneliness, from sickness, that you may be with us, that we know that you love us and care for us. And may Almighty God bless us all in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. And thanks to all of you for attending tonight. God bless Thank you all. Have a good night, Bye, everyone. God bless. God bless.